Welcome to Bedtime Chills. Tonight, we're taking a plunge into the world of scary horror stories set against the backdrop of a rainy night. Get ready to feel the shivers down your spine as we immerse ourselves in the chilling atmosphere. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe for more, and share your thoughts with us in the comments. So, where are you tuning in from? Let's dive headfirst into these hair-raising tales. So this story is true, however, as I get older, I question how much of it was real and how much of it was just my overactive childhood imagination. There is no doubt, though, that I had very real feelings of fear and anguish and I remember those feelings very vividly. This is the story of the worst vacation of my childhood. So first, some backstory. I was 12 at the time, my brother was 15. My parents had gotten a divorce about two years earlier and my father had just remarried to my current stepmother. My dad moved in with her and her mother in a pretty nice condo nearby. My stepmother and her mother were very nice people and I had no immediate problems with them. Shortly after their marriage, my dad wanted to take me and my brother on vacation to get acquainted with our new family. My stepmother's family had an old countryside villa about an hour north to which we would be spending a week just hanging out at the pool, barbecuing, family games, etc. I was completely against the idea of leaving my mom's house because at the time all I wanted to do was play video games and eat hot pockets, which was my perfect idea of a summer vacation, but nonetheless me and my brother packed up and went along. The house was huge and also very old. It had belonged to my step-grandmother's late husband's side of the family, and although it had been modernized and remodeled, it remained mostly vacant throughout the year save for whenever the family wanted to vacation there. My brother and I each got our own room, and we unpacked our things. My brother's room was right down the hall from mine. He peeked in shortly after getting settled in, hey let's go swimming. Alright, I muttered putting my Game Boy Advance down and fishing for my trunks in my backpack. My dad and stepmother had left to go to the store, leaving just me, my brother, the old lady, and her little poodle at the house. It was a hot summer day. We went down to the pool and, well, swam. My brother and I had lots of pool games we would play like who could hold their breath the longest were trying to decipher what the other one was saying while talking underwater. I was starting to have fun and was forgetting about being bitter about having been pried away from my precious Nintendo 64 and my summer gaming haven back home. This was also about the same time that things got creepy. I remember running outside the perimeter of the pool, the poodle chasing me, when the bushes bordering the property started to rustle. And by rustle it felt as though something was running alongside me. The moment this thought entered my head I immediately freaked myself out and jumped into the pool. The poodle started barking crazily, as she usually did when we jumped into the pool. The odd thing was that, when I surfaced, she was barking at the bushes, not me. Sure, this could have been just a small animal in it that caused all this, but I remember staring intently at the bushes and getting a sense of uneasiness. I told my brother what had happened and he was very much entertained by the fact that I was frightened by the bushes and what was probably just a squirrel. The day went on. We played card games, eat dinner, watched a movie and then retreated to our rooms. My biggest mistake was letting my brother know I was spooked about the place because he spent about an hour of the night trying to scare me by breathing heavily from the hallway or sneaking into my room and grabbing my feet, to the latter of which I finally let out a blood-curdling scream. My dad rushed upstairs to see my brother rolling on the floor laughing and me with a face, as he put it, as pale as a ghost. He told us to cut it out and sent my brother back to his room. I fell asleep. What I experienced that night was one of the most terrifying incidents in my life. It was my first run-in with what I would years later come to learn was sleep paralysis. I woke up in the dark room unable to move or speak. A dark shadowy figure hovered inches above my face. It moved back and then shifted menacingly from one side of the room to the other. All I remember is trying my hardest to yell for help, but I couldn't. 
It had a blurry humanoid form and emitted such a dark, evil presence. When it finally dissipated and my mobility returned, I ran quickly out of my room and downstairs into my dad's room. I shook him. He turned around, already fully lucid and awake, with the biggest smile on his face. He started snickering. I freaked the fuck out. Dad, I yelled, what's my middle name, meaning some justification that this laughing man was really my dad. This question caused him to start laughing madly. My body froze in sheer terror. He tilted his head, Michael. It was my middle name, but this man was not my father. As quickly as this realization came to me, I woke up. I immediately turned on the lights and spent the remainder of the night sitting up in my bed, playing Tony Hawk on my GBA, all the while trying my best to put aside the thoughts of the dark dream. Now all of this had rational explanations, but the memories of what happened for the remainder of the trip is where I, and I'm sure many readers will as well, start to question the mental stability and sanity of my 12-year-old self. I told everyone at breakfast the next morning about my nightmare. For the most part they all laughed and thought it to be quite humorous. My stepmother showed sympathy and gave me a hug saying that if it ever happened again that I could stay in their room. Her mother, however, seemed very interested in it all but didn't say a word and would stare, quite uncomfortably, at me for the remainder of the day. The day and following night went on without incident. When entering a room my dad would tilt his head jokingly, Michael, and my brother didn't stop teasing me about it, Justin. What's your middle name? It all actually helped to alleviate my fears and left me feeling silly about the whole thing. So much so that I had no problem being left at the house alone with my step-grandmother when my brother had to be taken to the urgent care for a severe earache he had gotten the next day. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon I'd say, just as bright and sunny as it has been all week. I was heading downstairs to the pool when the old lady stopped me from the kitchen. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, I'm fine. Was just going to go swim a little bit. I responded as I made my way to the back door. I mean your nightmare. They can be quite frightening. Are you okay? She continued. Yeah, I forced a laugh. It was just a dream. I'm fine. Still trying to move towards the door. I had awful, awful nightmares as a girl. So I know just how frightening they can be. She looked at me sincerely. I said nothing. She continued, do you pray? I rarely did, despite my upbringing, yeah I do. I lied, hoping to end the conversation quickly. Good. Make sure you pray as much as you can. Sometimes it's the only way to get rid of them. The way she emphasized the word made me feel cold. As if the nightmare was much more than a nightmare. Okay, I will. I said most likely in a shaky voice. With that I finally made my way to the pool hoping to not think about it again and just swim around in the sun. I love to swim and play pretend in the pool by myself, acting like a torpedo or a dolphin, doing handstands and flips underwater throwing punches and kicks as if I were fighting some underwater Power Ranger villain. At one point I tried to see if I could hold my breath and torpedo my way from one end of the pool to the other without surfacing. I did it successfully a couple times and felt pretty badass. On the last run I did, I surfaced right under the diving board, with not a whiff of air left in my lungs, and saw her. A little girl, younger than me, was hanging her head over the diving board right above me, we were face to face. She had wet dark hair that I swore I could feel brush on my forehead. She was pale, had gray circles around her eyes, and worst of all was smiling menacingly at me as I gasped for air and panicked for my life. With nowhere in my lungs, I couldn't scream so I flailed helplessly in the water, somehow managed to get to an adjacent edge, and got the fuck out of the pool. I sprinted inside without looking back. Goodness. You're soaking wet. Dry yourself off. Was the first thing my new grandmother cried as I came rushing in. You look like you've seen a ghost. Are you okay? Did you almost drown? 
Here, let's get you a towel. She went out back and my eyes followed her through the window. No girl inside, of course, just an empty pool with an unoccupied diving board. Come out, dear, you're getting the floor soaked. I went out and explained to her what I saw. She immediately gave me a hug and tried to calm me down. I wanted her to tell me that there was no such thing of ghosts and that my mind was just playing tricks on me. I wanted her to tell me anything that would comfort me, but she didn't. She took everything I said as actual happenstance and even asked for more details on the girl and if I had seen anything else. No. No. Nothing else, just her. I said, I don't know what to do. She grasped me by the shoulders and looked intently in my eyes. Honey, you need to pray. Jesus will help it all go away. I hated how seriously she was taking this. I hated how she gave validity to what I saw and talked about it as a real tangible thing. Looking back, I think she would have caused much less anguish with me if she would have just brushed it off as a silly childhood trick of the imagination. She didn't. Okay, I will pray, I said quietly. She continued to look at me, dissatisfied with my answer, Here honey, let's go inside and we'll pray now. After drying off we sat down at the table, she grabbed my hand and started praying out loud. I don't remember exactly what she said in her prayer, but something along the lines of asking the Holy Ghost to be with me. I will admit, it made me feel better. I won't tell your father unless you want me to. She said afterwards, nobody else has to know. At this point I felt completely silly about the whole thing. No, I didn't want my dad to know, or anyone else for that matter, even her. I just wanted it to go away. I didn't want to pray to Jesus every night and I didn't want people to think that I thought I saw a ghost, I wanted normalcy. It's fine. I really do think it was just me daydreaming or something. I said. I remember briefly heading upstairs to my room, being freaked out by being alone, grabbing my GBA, and heading back downstairs to play it in the front room. That night, after an evening of car games and pizza, we watched, I remember specifically, What About Bob? With Bill Murray. I fell asleep on the couch. The nightmare that followed paled in comparison to the one I had the other night and, to this day, was the most unsettling dream I've ever had. The same little girl that haunted me with her presence earlier that day revisited me in my dream. In the dream, she was not as pale and seemed much more normal and human, and actually, turned out to be quite friendly. She apologized for scaring me and told me her name, although I completely forget it. The dream consisted of us traveling everywhere from an old school that she said was hers, to a science museum, to a county fair. It was all very vivid and not at all frightening. We ended up at one point lying down in the grass and just talking and becoming friends. I ended up liking her. Then I went home, to my mom's house where I grew up. What I experienced there disturbed me so much that it made me sick, in the dream and upon waking up. When I entered the house, my family wouldn't acknowledge me unless I screamed at them, and when they finally did, they did so in an annoyed and disinterested manner, like I didn't matter. I walked through the house and every picture of me was somehow distorted. In one family picture, in which I was too, holding a stuffed big bird, my eyes were completely gone. In another, a picture of me from kindergarten, I had dark eyes, a goatee, and a golden tooth, comical, perhaps, to those reading, but completely terrifying to me in my dream, and one where I had no face at all. It was such a dark feeling. I had been replaced by something sinister and demonic, and my family no longer recognized me for me. The little girl then began laughing hysterically at me. What did you do? What happened? I begged for an answer. She continued to laugh. Then my entire family joined in on laughing at me. My mother picked her up and headed out of the room. She continued to laugh at me over my mother's shoulder. I was then enveloped by darkness. Despair. Nothingness. 
I woke up about 1 a.m. to find myself alone in the dark empty room. My family had all gone to bed. The sickness persisted in me. I couldn't shake it off, even after realizing it was just a dream. I turned on the nearest light and ran upstairs, not concerning myself with turning it back off. I didn't dare sleep alone, so I snuck into my brother's room with a blanket and a pillow and decided to sleep on the floor. With me I also had my GBA and the small bendable LED lamp that came with it. For those who don't remember, the GBA didn't have a backlit screen, so this made it possible to play in the dark. I couldn't sleep. I tried my best to just play my game and shut out the world. The house wouldn't let me. It would creak, moan, and whisper, haunting my every waking moment. I surrendered into a corner and held my GBA lamp light against the room, scanning the walls for anything unnatural. I was completely terrified. I heard my brother shift in his bed. I quickly moved the dim light over to him. I saw him sleeping on his back with one arm standing straight into the air, his wrist limp. Then all of a sudden his arm dropped back down to the bed. This was enough for me. I darted to turn on the light and woke him up. What are you doing? He asked drearily. We need to keep the lights on. Please, Scott? I asked helplessly. Oh my god, you're such a baby. Get out of my room and go sleep in yours. I had no choice but to explain to him everything that had happened, the girl on the diving board, the nightmare, his arm being raised into the air as if by some ghostly presence. While explaining all this, a muffled scream, as if from a little girl, came from downstairs. His widened eyes met mine. The little poodle started barking loudly for about ten seconds then stopped. Silence. Should we go check it out? I finally managed. I babysit for a living. It's not the most glamorous of work, but once you're over 21 and have racked up enough good reviews, it becomes a pretty good, steady source of income, and plenty of people are willing to pay upwards of $15 an hour for a part-time steady sitter they know they can trust with their kids. It's what's kept me above water since I moved to New York City a few years ago, and while I theoretically plan to eventually move into another field, I'm very happy with where I am. Of course, sometimes you hit dry spells. Last summer was a pretty stressful time for me, as one of the families I was working with had abruptly decided to put their two-year-old son in daycare instead, leaving me to rake through my savings and ask a couple of friends to help me out until school started again and I'd be back to my usual school year duties. In mid-August 2013, however, I was doing a quick fill-in job with a kid I'd used to pick up from school regularly when I got an email alert saying a family on the Upper West Side needed someone to watch their daughter for the next two weeks. I sensed that their problem and mine could solve each other, so I took a moment to send my contact information and arranged to call the mom who was looking for help as soon as I was done with this other job for the day. We hit it off immediately, and I showed up at their apartment bright and early the next morning to meet my new temporary charge. She was a bright, happy little girl no maladjustment or even social awkwardness to be found here. For the purposes of this story, we'll call her Lucy. Lucy was very much the kind of little girl who likes wearing about three or four necklaces at a time and a tutu over her leggings, and since most of my babysitting experience has been with little boys, it was fun getting to do things like nail painting and playing with Barbies for a change. While we were at a playground Central Park, I heard Lucy talking to herself. I asked if she was playing pretend, and she said she was talking to her friend. She pronounced the friend's name as Mitt, and I didn't give it much thought. Imaginary friends are totally normal with small kids, and Lucy even preemptively reassured me that she and her friend were just playing tag. Over the next few hours, she mentioned that Mitt was a little girl, age five, two years younger than Lucy herself, and that she liked to hug. It was cute I wasn't going to object to any of this. I'd had imaginary friends of my own as a kid. Later in the day, I mentioned that I collected Monster High dolls, 
and Lucy asked if I could bring them over to play. After getting the proper reassurance that she'd be gentle with them, I said that I would, of course, and I showed up the next day with a bag full of monster dolls to play with. Lucy was particularly taken with Cleo Denial, the Egyptian princess slash mummy character, and I made a private resolution to make sure I bought Lucy a Cleo of her own before the job was over. While we were playing in the living room, I heard a kind of odd chittering sound coming from Lucy's room. This being an upper west side apartment, the hallway was all of 10 feet long and slightly bent, so the sound wasn't very far away or hard to pinpoint the source of. However, if there's another thing to remember about the Upper West Side, it's that it's full of pigeons, so I made a comment about how we should see if there's a sick pigeon outside of Lucy's room. Oh, said Lucy. That's not a pigeon. That's Mitt. I thought you said Mitt was a little girl, I said, frowning. Well, she doesn't look like one anymore, said Lucy. I was sufficiently creeped out by this that I asked if she'd like to go somewhere else today, a museum or something, and we wound up going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art on the other side of Central Park. Lucy asked if we could go to the Egyptian section so she could show me something, and I agreed. I figured she was still hung up on Cleo, whom she had very strongly declared her favorite monster. Lucy started zooming down the halls, and I followed her right up until she stopped excitedly in front of a sarcophagus behind a glass panel and pointed. The sarcophagus contained the mummified body of a five-year-old ancient Egyptian girl named M.Y.T. Well, that was a little morbid, but I didn't judge. I'd had pretty spooky pretend games when I was Lucy's age hell. The whole reason I'd started collecting monster high dolls in the first place was because I wished they'd made them when I was little. I also thought that it was cute, and it explained why she gravitated toward Cleo. As for the chittering well, that was probably just her working that sound into her game, no differently than when the lights would flicker in my house while I was little, and I'd say my ghost friends did it. That evening, I mentioned what had happened to Lucy's mom, and the color drained from her face. She showed you MYT? Yes. Why? I thought it was cute. She's got a real thing for mummies. It's adorable. Lucy's mom tugged me in the kitchen while Lucy played with my Cleo doll in the living room and lowered her voice. She explained that their family had only lived in New York for two years, since Lucy was not quite five. They'd moved from Chicago, and when they first moved to New York, Lucy's parents took turns taking her to various attractions while the other parents stayed at home to finish setting up their apartment. MYT made her first appearance days before they'd ever brought their daughter to the Met. Lucy was talking to her and playing with her before she ever seen MYT's sarcophagus in fact. It was Lucy who asked if they could go to what she called the Mapolitan Museum because MYT wants to show me something. When Lucy's mom brought her there, Lucy had gone running down halls she'd never been down and stopped at a sarcophagus she'd never seen before and excitedly told her mom there's MYT. I didn't know how to respond, and I felt suddenly very uncomfortable. I changed the subject to how much Lucy liked the dolls, and we went ahead and made an agreement to try to get her a Cleo of her own within the next few weeks. MYT never showed any signs of malevolence or even control, though I still had a hard time getting over that chittering sound. It was only a few days before my last day taking care of Lucy that I remembered that the ancient Egyptians believed the part of the soul that contained the personality the part we think of as analogous to the ghost took the form of a bird. It's been two years and some change since this event happened. I want to say that I am a logical person, Mumbo Jumbo doesn't exactly jive well with me. If something strange happens, I immediately try to figure out why in a scientific way. I think this night terrifies me because there is no real scientific explanation, no real closure on what the fuck happened to us during a simple camping trip. I'll get on with the story. As a 24-year-old mother fresh out of the Navy, I wanted to spend time with my 3-year-old, Harley. Working in the military meant I spent a lot of her life away from her and I wanted to reconnect. It was a spontaneous decision. 
I was good at those. I didn't want a campground. I didn't want other people around me pretending to be camping while they settled on a piece of mowed clearing next to their car. I wanted real camping, authentic primitive camping. That's actually much harder to find, believe it or not. I turned to Google, found a place about an hour away, and packed up the car. I invited the people living with me. I had a pretty complicated living situation with my, now ex, husband Joe, his mistress Chelsea, and her male roommate John. At the time, we were all under a ton of relationship tension, trying to figure out what we were all doing without arguing. So we were being friendly, cordial even. They agreed to the camping trip. We figured it would be nice to get away together. We even brought our dog, Jake. The second we were all in the car, I punched the address into my navigation system and off we went. That's when the trouble started, and probably when we should have turned around. It was about 3 p.m. by the time we left. My navigation suggested about three hours to the campgrounds. That was enough time to hike the mile from the parking area to the campgrounds, set up camp, and enjoy the night before it became too dark. Satisfied, we broke out snacks and enjoyed some time swapping funny stories. My daughter enjoyed eating cookies in the car. By 6 p.m., we realized we couldn't find the damn place. My navigation told me we were there, but it wasn't a campground. Frustrations running high, I stopped at a Walmart and asked for directions to the campground. After they were done laughing in my face, the kind women told me I had overshot the campgrounds by an hour. She handed me an old-fashioned map, showed me the route, and continued laughing as I purchased the map. I left feeling angry, but also weirded out. The lady had laughed way beyond what felt like normal, I chalked it up to being a bitch and went back to the car. Once we were on the right track, our friendly banter started up again. It was starting to get dark, but I didn't want to be discouraged. We could do this. It was a stupid camping trip, easy peasy. I realized just how wrong I was when it took another two hours to find the campground. There was supposed to be a big sign. A little dugout area for a car or three. It was now dark, and that big sign turned out to be a little sign half hidden by trees. We had passed it for two hours, going back and forth, arguing and fighting about if we should just give up the damn search for this stupid place. That's when John noticed the sign. Gratefully, I parked in the little grass lot. Joe happily pointed out that there was the little trail we were looking for. It looked like a well-traveled deer trail. I was pumped now. This was the primitive camping I was hoping for. We put on our backpacks full of gear and sprayed each other down with bug spray. I handed Harley her bottle of water and took her hand. She was tired, but excited to be out of the car. Jake trotted beside us, pulling his leash, tense but happy. We meandered down the path for about half a mile before coming into a clearing. There were large mounds in this clearing and a little half-sheltered information booth. I remember quite clearly that the website had stated to walk a full mile before coming across any camp clearings, but no one wanted to listen to me. Everyone was tired, it was dark, and we wanted to just set up camp. I set Harley down by the shelter as it had started to drizzle. The weather didn't call for rain, but it was super hot and humid, we welcomed the light rain. We tied Jacob to the shelter as John dug a fire pit. Joe and Chelsea started setting up the tent. Harley stuck by John's side while I decided to find some dry wood. That's when curiosity took over and I peeked at the information booth. I expected trail numbers and a big map. Instead, I read about the Native American burial grounds. Hey guys, this is an Indian burial ground. I told them, my voice shaking. John and Joe shrugged. We have Native American blood in us. I think we are good. Chelsea piped up, unlike a quarter Native American. Yeah, and Harley is part Native American too. Joe pointed out, smiling as if proud his genes were good for something. 
I nodded at them. I'm fucking Irish. I don't want to camp next to the burial mounds. If we keep walking down the path. John shook his head. We'll be fine, Eve. We're all tired, and I don't feel like hiking any further. Fine, if something happens, I want it publicly known that I did not want to camp here. I turned to the burial mounds. I'm sorry, I mean no disrespect, please let us camp here for the night. The others laughed at me and went on to make jokes about offerings before settling into their tasks. I grabbed the axe we had brought, as well as my forearm sized knife, and decided to find some firewood. My daughter stayed with John, just in case I happened upon a wild animal and needed to fight or run. Oh, wow, look, some idiot party here and left trash. I muttered out loud. Apparently, Chelsea had followed me, that's disrespectful. I nodded. Remind me, in case I forget, to pick that crap up before we leave. I don't want any bad mojo. We decided to wander a bit down a separate path to find firewood. After we had struggled through some gigantic spider webs and had found a decent amount of wood, we wandered back to find a nice fire and our tent up. Jake was dozing peacefully by the tent and Harley was playing in the dirt, content. I smiled. Finally, camping. The crickets and frogs were croaking peacefully. The sky was thick with clouds, but there was a decent breeze. If only it wasn't so stiflingly humid. I tried to get John alone to talk to him, but he was being withdrawn and gloomy. Joe and Chelsea wandered into the tent to relax and talk, which left me alone. I decided to get rid of some pent-up frustration by hacking some firewood off a fallen tree down the main path, away from everyone, alone in the dark. My anger made me fearless, up until I made it to the tree. I felt eyes on me. Not malicious eyes, but eyes nonetheless. As I walked down the path, I felt my anger ebb and fear fill its place. I was suddenly nervous. I've been camping before and have been watched by foxes, bears, etc. This didn't feel like those times. I didn't feel haunted, I just felt watched. I tried to brush it away as being alone in the woods and having read too many horror stories. I started swinging the axe and immediately felt better. I felt watched, but better. I swung until I had taken off most of the fallen tree's bigger branches, my shoulders were aching and stiff. I grabbed my flashlight and went to leave when I heard something rustle in the bushes. I jumped, axe in one hand, flashlight in the other. Chelsea came around the bend. My heart was in my throat, hammering, and I angrily asked what she was doing. She wanted to talk. I grabbed the newly cut firewood and walked beside her, talking. After the talk, I wanted to go back to chopping at the damn tree, but I decided against it. I was too spooked. I apparently wasn't the only one spooked. When we got back, John and Joe were talking rapidly, wide-eyed. I dropped the firewood and asked what had happened. We saw a Native American woman. Joe exclaimed, pointing to the place where I had seen the trash. She was right there. John saw her too, didn't you? I looked around for a moment, perplexed and a bit incredulous, before realizing Harley wasn't around. Where's Harley? I demanded suddenly afraid. In the tent, playing. She was getting eaten up by bugs even with the bug spray. Joe stated quickly. Can you believe it? John, tell them. John didn't say anything. He sat by the fire and poked at it, his eyes wide. For a moment, we were all silent, listening to the fire. It was as if we all felt it at the same time. That same feeling of being watched overwhelmed us, and I swallowed hard, my hand going to the knife at my hip. Do you guys feel dash, I started. At that moment, John jumped up and put his finger to his lips. SHH. Do you hear that? He asked, his eyes widening further. 
We listened. I suddenly noticed all the normal forest noises had stopped. No crickets, no frogs, no hissing insects, just silence. And the pounding. Is that drums? Chelsea whispered. We were all standing, all crying against each other. It sounds kind of like the ocean. I whispered back. But we are smack in the middle of Florida. There is no ocean around here. Just a small lake. No, definitely drums. Joe said, his voice somber. The bushes across the fire rustled and we all jumped straight out of our skins, but the howl that followed the rustle was enough to elicit a scream from Chelsea. It sounded awful, like a woman being murdered viciously. It also sounded close. John turned to look at me and my eyes widened. Get in the tent. I yelled. Put another log on the fire. It could be a cougar. Florida had what they call panthers. They looked like mountain lions and were one of the reasons I was carrying the big knife. Not that I could kill one, but I wasn't going to go down without a fight if it did happen. The howl didn't sound like the panther's call. I had googled it, just in case, but I wasn't going to chance it. Jake, ever calm and noble, was snarling and yanking on his leash. I untied him and put him in the tent with us. For a while, we all sat in the tent and listened. The strange silence had returned and we commented on it for a few minutes. Chelsea decided we should listen to some music on her phone to help us focus on something else. I was watching the fire through the little mesh opening that served as our window. The fire was dying down. I didn't like that, not even a bit. We need to put more wood on the fire. I said in the music-laden silence. No one offered to go out there. It had been about half an hour since the strange scream. My daughter was still politely playing with Jake and the toys we had brought her. It was strange that she was still up and was so quiet the entire time, but we were all too high-strung to really notice. Angry that the boys weren't offering to stoke the fire, I grabbed the axe and a flashlight. John shook his head. Eve, the fire died. Look. It's just embers. Don't go out there. If it's a cat, it'll brave just one person. I shook my head and made for the door anyway. Just as I started to unzip the door, John gasped. I could see through the fabric of the tent as the fire blazed back to life on its own. I walked back over to the window. Harley had decided to lay down now, and I gingerly stepped over her. The fire was crackling and bright, despite the logs being completely ash. Maybe a breeze helped? I thought. I'm going to put a log on it before it burns out. I muttered, trying to contain my fear with rationality. Before anyone could protest, I zipped open the flap and stood up fully in the light of the fire. I checked the bushes for the telltale sign of glowing eyes and saw nothing. I heard nothing. I swallowed hard and made my way to the logs and the fire, axe ready in case something jumped out at me. I felt the eyes again. Not malicious, not hunted, just watched. It was the creepiest feeling I could possibly conceive. I'd rather something had jumped out at me. Instead, I put three logs on the strangely robust fire and, feigning calm, walked back to the tent. Let's try to sleep before the fire goes out. If we stay up like this, we'll just continue to hear creepy stuff. It's the middle of the woods, after all. I muttered, lying down beside my drowsy daughter. John lay down on the other side of Harley. Joe and Chelsea arranged themselves at our feet so that we were all comfortable. No blankets were needed in this heat. I draped my arm around my daughter. She closed her eyes and, as I closed mine, the screaming began. My daughter sat straight up. She hadn't been asleep a second. She clamped her hands over her ears and started singing rain, rain go away, screaming as if someone was stabbing her. We all bolted upright, and I quickly grabbed her, trying to soothe her, 
trying to get her to pull her hands from her ears. My heart was hammering. Everyone was staring at her with their mouths open. She wouldn't stop. Screaming, singing, screaming, singing. Tears were falling down her cheeks, but she wouldn't stop. Suddenly, she stopped mid-scream and opened her eyes. She looked lost in thought, older than three, as if she wasn't even awake. She stated, calmly, the Indians are coming. First, let me assure you that no one said anything about the burial grounds in front of her. She was three. She could form sentences, but I had never sung her rain, rain, go away. She didn't attend a daycare. No one else told her about the Native Americans. We had talked about the frogs and the crickets, but nothing else. After she made that statement, the silent forest erupted. I have no better way to describe the sudden noise that bombarded us. There were hundreds of animals screaming, howling, growling, barking, hooting around us. Strong, steady, calm Jake was shivering and whimpering in the corner of the tent, far from Harley in the door. My daughter went back to singing and screaming while the rest of us lost our fucking minds. What the hell is going on? Joe was screaming. Do you hear the drums? It sounds like a fucking war. I put my daughter back on the floor. Her eyes were rolling in their sockets, and I didn't know what to do. My heart was going to explode. My hand was on my knife, but what was that going to do? Didn't the Indians imitate wildlife? John yelled over the ridiculously loud gunshots, or was it thunder? Yes. I muttered, my eyes wide. Holy shit, yes, they did. I remember reading about that. We were yelling at each other now, over the bushes rustling and the loud banging and the horrible screams. There was that fucking owl again. The screaming cougar. The howling coyote. The wolf. The cat. The owl. So fucking close. I felt the panic attack coming until I looked at Harley again. Then I was angry. Leave her alone. I screamed and stood. She's fucking three. This is her first camping trip. Leave her the fuck alone. I was crying now, furious, ready to fight, wanting to fight, if only it would all just stop. Just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. My daughter blinked a few times. She yawned and lay back down while we stared at her, incredulous. I was crying hard now, more in relief and disbelief than anything else. It was so quiet, I almost wished for the noise again. Then, a cricket. Soft at first, then louder. Finally, the forest was in full song again, and I collapsed back on my exhausted butt. What the fuck just happened? I asked tiredly. We all stared at each other in confusion and fear. I don't know, but I think we should leave. John said quietly. I'm sorry, you were right. We shouldn't have camped here. I nodded. Let's just try to sleep. It's two in the morning. We'll leave once the sun comes up. Everyone else nodded and we all lay back down. I gripped my sleeping daughter tightly. She was steadily breathing, absolutely fine, as if nothing had happened. I shivered, remembering her ungodly screams and the creepy singing. Finally, I started to doze. Slap. I jerked awake. Someone had slapped me. I waited for someone to say they had smacked a mosquito off of my thigh, but no one said anything. Finally. I turned to John. Did you just slap me? I asked, curious. John turned over and shook his head. I heard it though. Joe, Chelsea? Did you slap me? I asked, my voice shaking. Both Joe and Chelsea sat up and shook their heads. I looked down at my thigh just to be sure. And there it was. A red welt in the shape of a hand. My heart started to pound again as I remembered my anger, 
my screaming. Did I just fuck up? I opened my mouth and shut it quickly. The silence was back. Something dripped on the tent and I wondered, for the briefest of moments, if it was raining. When I looked up and the others looked with me, I let out the tiniest moan of despair. Blood. Blood had hit the tent. All of my nightmares rose in my mind. What the fuck was hanging over our tent? A dead body? A mutilated animal? Something else equally fucked up and PTSD inducing? Is. Is that. John stuttered, pointing. I didn't know what to say because I couldn't open my mouth to say anything. My daughter was stirring at this point. The silence was oppressive, almost daring. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And, at 3.37 in the morning, the forest erupted for the second time. As soon as the noise begun, my daughter was awake. She started singing. Everyone was screaming at this point, scared out of their minds, while I sat there in stunned silence. I couldn't move. This wasn't real life, this was some kind of scary movie you only see on TV. Maybe if I sat really still, it would all go away, and someone would come out and tell me how silly I looked all scared on TV. But no one came, and no one was making a fucking decision. We are leaving. I yelled over everyone else. Let's go, just stick your shit in the bags. Don't leave anything behind. I started shoving miscellaneous objects into backpacks. I couldn't help my daughter. She just sat in the middle of the tent rocking back and forth, singing and screaming, her eyes rolling crazy in their sockets. I tried not to look at her as we finished cleaning up the inside. If I had, I'd probably cover my ears and sing a childhood song too. Once we were done with the inside, the noises started to quiet outside. We jumped out of the tent anyway and started dismantling the tent. I kept a lookout for any animals, or worse, while clutching my daughter's forearm. She kept singing. I wanted to yell at her, to tell her to stop, but I couldn't do it. I loved her so much, and I couldn't believe this was happening to her. Instead, I focused on the grim task of making sure nothing was going to get us. After we were all packed, we started down the path. We were being watched. I stopped, suddenly remembering the trash, and cursed under my breath. I have to get that garbage, I promised. There is no fucking way I'm backing out of that now, I growled, terrified. Chelsea, surprisingly, went with me. We picked up the garbage and shoved it into our backpacks before hurrying back to the others. John made sure the fire was completely covered with dirt for the second time. As we started down the path again, the eerie silence settled again. Our watchers stayed with us the entire way. We could feel them. Halfway back to the car, Harley stopped and looked behind us. She muttered, tiredly, Mommy, the Indians are coming. She had that faraway look in her eye, as if she wasn't quite standing on earth, and she looked haggard. I nodded. Wave goodbye. I muttered sarcastically. She waved. I tried not to shiver, but failed. We threw our crap into the car and piled in. Regular forest noises surrounded us. You could almost believe nothing had happened. All four of us rolled our windows down and shouted apologies. As we started to drive, we even felt a bit silly. Terrified, but silly. We were hungry, so we stopped at a checkers. It was four in the morning. John stuck his head out the back window and asked the cashier, have you ever been camping down the road? The woman shook her head. No, here's your food, sir. John looked her dead in the eye, grabbed his food, and told her, don't. The fucking place is haunted. I drove off as the woman stared at us. Chelsea started the laughter. Then Joe then John, and finally, me. We were all laughing hysterically. The adrenaline was over, 
We had made it. We didn't die. We felt silly. We never talked about that fucking place again, though every once in a while, my now six-year-old will ask if I remember the Indians, because she does. Rain, rain, go away. I work in a canning plant, one of the largest in the world. It's pretty much a 24-7 operation as a result. For this summer, I got an internship in the quality control lab running food safety checks around the production and warehouse areas. I've come across many weird things in my inspections, rats eating their own trap dead, crack pipes and burr roaches, and one time I even walked in on two warehouse employees fucking behind a row of pallets 35 feet high. None of these things could have prepared me for what happened yesterday and this morning. The other night, there was a storm. A real nasty one. Gale force winds and torrential rains. Night shift lost power about halfway through, decided to send everyone home and close until morning. By the time I arrived for my 7 a.m. shift, there were cops, power plant workers, and emergency response vehicles surrounding the facility. People were standing around the outside break area, smoking their cigarettes while waiting for the go-ahead to return to work. I made my way through the crowd, approached the plant manager Frank, and asked him what was going on. Apparently during the storm, the winds were too strong and felled a tree that in turn knocked down the back wall of warehouse number 5. A solid 40-foot stretch of wall was destroyed, along with some of the ceiling and tons of canned food pallets. Frank told me that once we got the all clear, him and I would need to talk a walk around the warehouse areas to take inventory of what we had lost. Since warehouse number 5 is fairly unused in the off-season except for empty can pallets and tow motor storage, work wasn't canceled for the day. Frank said in the meantime, I could organize the MSDS stickers for the various sanitation chemicals we kept in the front offices, which were still open. After about an hour of writing and attaching morning stickers to barrels of chemicals, Frank came into the storage room and told me that they were ready for the inspection. We had to clear the other four warehouses before allowing the remaining employees access. The inspection started off as fairly routine in the production areas and warehouse number one. An old water bottle here, some dirty gloves there, nothing out of the ordinary. Warehouse number two is where things started to get weird. If you have ever been to warehouse for canned products, you understand how creepy walking down the narrow rows between pallet stacks can be. 40-foot high stacks of silver cans towering over a 2.5-foot wide path that is nearly pitch black, even in full daylight. Not something for the claustrophobics out there. Anyway, we were about 20 feet down a path between two stacks when about five or six cans rained down from above. Only one made contact with Frank, but it was with the back of his head. Except for a sharp grunt, he was silenced immediately, no time to register what happened. In all the panic of the morning, Frank had forgotten his hard hat, and I never would have thought to question the manager. I rushed to Frank, blood welling from a wound on his head like a blooming rose. I could hear more cans were raining down in the main walkways and in the small rows between other stacks, but I ignored them. My fingers instinctively went to this neck, searching for a pulse, a beat, anything. After a few anxious seconds, I found it. Faint, but there, nonetheless. I grabbed Frank's radio and began to call for help, but thankfully emergency workers had heard the cans drop and came to check things out. They helped carry Frank out from the pallets and into an ambulance waiting at the nearest exit. At the time, I could feel nothing but pity and guilt for Frank, but now, I see that he was the lucky one. After taking some time to collect myself, I decided to continue on the inspection. Using Frank's radio, I called Carlos, the quality control manager, and asked him to help me. He responded saying that he was already in warehouse number three. As I walked there, I noticed cans from various pallets scattered across the floor. It wasn't too hard to see that this was the case all the way to warehouse number three. 
whatever had knocked down those cans had come from there. Just a family of squirrels chasing each other, or a scavenging raccoon. As I entered warehouse number three, I immediately saw a large gathering of workers and volunteers standing near a collapsed row of pallets. Since I was in quality control, I couldn't help but wince that was at least $30,000 worth of product gone. Getting closer, I could see the workers collectively muttering about something that had clearly disturbed them. Carlos turned away from them, holding a gallon can in his hands, and ran towards me. What going on here? I asked, did they hear about Frank? Did you guys find something? Carlos stared at me with wide eyes. Yes, he said silently, and held up the gallon can. It was a standard can of sloppy Joe mix, but as I took it from his hands, I could see three large puncture marks that ripped into the other side of the can. Claws. I looked back at the row of destroyed pallets. The can I held in my hands was probably the most intact of them all, with most looking like crumpled balls of tinfoil, while the others were ripped open and drained of their contents. Ow! I managed to stammer, unable to comprehend the curveball reality had just pitched me. Whatever had opened these cans was huge and strong. Very strong. I looked up at the tops of the surrounding pallet stacks, half hoping and half fearing what I would see. Nothing. I sighed momentary relief and asked Carlos if he could escort me on warehouses number three and number four. He agreed, glad to get away from warehouse number three. Besides more knocked down cans and the destruction at the back of warehouse number five, there wasn't much else to see. If there was something inside, it seemingly only targeted the sloppy Joe mix. Carlos and I helped the rest of the workers sort through the mess and assess product losses, which took up the rest of my shift. I went home last night exhausted and passed out on my couch almost immediately. I woke up at 4.37 a.m. this morning to the sound of my phone ringing. I let it ring, since I still had a few more hours until work. A little bit after the ringing stopped, I heard it vibrate again to signify that I had received a voicemail. Already awake, I decided to check it out. It was probably my mom having a nightmare about me or something. Instead, I had three missed calls and a voicemail from David, a QC night shift worker who I knew from high school. Given the previous day's events, I figured some other shit had gone down. I couldn't make out much at first. It sounded like a typical pocket dial, but I could make out distant sounds. Heavy breathing. Hurried footsteps. The crash of cans on concrete. A bellowing roar. I've heard a lot of animals and weird noises before. Anyone ever heard the noise a fox makes? That song isn't far from the truth, but that roar, that was one of the most hellish sounds I've ever heard in my life. I turned up the volume on my phone and held it close to my ear, waiting for another roar. It was silent for about 10 seconds, and then I heard a person quietly sobbing. Ayuda por favor. Dios mío, Ayuda. This pleading continued for another few seconds before another roar appeared, nearly bursting my eardrum and causing me to drop the phone. Then the voicemail ended. I checked the clock again. 4.44 a.m. I didn't have to be to work for another two hours, but David was obviously in trouble. I didn't stop to think. I didn't want to. I just wanted to save my friend. Racing there with my heart pounding in my ears, I had no idea what to expect. Nor could I have. Flying into the closest parking space, I sprinted out of my car and through the front offices. If I had taken my time, I would have noticed that less than half of the night shift's cars were remaining in the lot. All the rest had fled. When I entered the production area, I nearly fled myself. The power was completely out, with the exception of the security lights. Those were enough to see the shimmer of red across the floor. Pools of blood slowly flowed into drains that were clogged with chunks of flesh, bone, and hair. I dropped to my knees and covered my mouth, trying not to scream, and then vomited through my fingers. 
There was no running from the smell. My body was frozen in place. Do I run? Do I scream? What do I do? My panic was broken by a series of gunshots from warehouse number one, followed by screams cut bloody short. I pissed myself a little in fear. Guns don't stop this thing. What does? I heard the crash of cans as a pallet stack was knocked over. I scrambled to my feet and sprinted back to the storage room in the front offices. Once inside, I locked the doors and pulled my phone out. David didn't answer. I can only assume that this beast got him in the voicemail I listened to. Out of anger, I chucked it against the wall and it shattered. A crazed sob escaped me. Why did I do that? Why didn't I run away? Am I going to die here? I broke down in tears. A few minutes passed, and then I heard the rumble of trucks outside the facility and saw lights flash through the long window. Cars people help. I stood up and looked out the window to see not police or the emergency response vehicles from before, but instead military trucks. One of them was a large dark green Humvee with a man standing in the turret. I assumed that it was his voice that came over their loudspeakers. Attention, this is the United States military. We are currently establishing a quarantine zone over this facility and the surrounding area. If there is anyone still breathing in there, you will not be allowed to leave alive until we have completely confirmed the threat is removed. He continued to speak, but I was too angry to listen or care. I paced the room impatiently, a dead man walking. If what I had seen of the beast's strength was any indication, a nuclear strike would probably be the only way to successfully remove this threat. I collapsed against the wall and buried my head in my hands. I remained in that position for a little while, listening to the hustle and bustle of the military outside the building. I kept running my options through my head. Should I just kill myself? Should I risk leaving? Could I lure the beast to them? It wasn't until I looked up and across the room that I got an idea worth having. Directly across from me were the barrels of sanitation chemicals I had labeled in detail yesterday morning. How did I not think of that right away? I only wrote it about 20 times. We have two types of sanitary cleaner, UMAC and TCHLOR. One of the biggest hazards of UMAC is that it is an oxidizing agent that can cause reactions in other chemicals. If UMAC is mixed with any chemicals containing chlorine, it reacts to release chlorine gas. Deadly chlorine gas. Well, it just so happens that the main ingredient in TCHLOR is chlorine, who would have guessed, and I had about 10 55-gallon drums for each of the cleaners in the storage room. I grabbed a crowbar, a couple of air masks used when cleaning old machine parts, and rolled three drums of each onto a service cart. Taking a deep breath, trying to steady my trembling legs, I unlocked the door, pushed the cart out into the main hallway, and started to push towards the swing doors to production. Ramming through the doors, the drums almost spilled off the cart, but luckily, I kept balance and continued to speedily push towards the QC lab in the middle of production. I started to whistle and shout to catch the beast's attention, half expecting to be snatched up before I realized what happened. There was no immediate response. I shouted louder and started banging the crowbar against one of the drums. Still nothing. The QC lab is located in the middle of each production area, with two steel doors leading to each and no windows. I opened the one of the doors and rolled the barrels off the cart and into the lab. The room was untouched. I tore my shirt off and stuffed it in the only drain. I put on three of the filter masks and pried off the top of one of the TCHLOR drums with the crowbar and allowed the chemicals to spill onto the floor. Where is it? Does it know I'm trying to trick it? With no time to spare for negative thoughts, I opened the other two barrels of TCHLOR and added them to the pool of chemicals already a few inches deep. As I finished dumping the last drum, I heard a large crash and a subsequent growl from outside the door I didn't enter. It's here. 
I got the UMAC drums in place. I began emptying them into the pool, grabbed a few spoilage cans from the countertop, and opened the door. A humanoid creature was perched on top of the production machinery, standing out in the dim glow of the security lights. It was a gaunt thing, with long, sinewy arms and legs. Pale, gray skin stretched too tight over varicose veins and rippled muscles. Its hands were more finger than palm, with black claws stretching several inches out from each. The claws dug into something resting out of the light to its left, and lifted it to its mouth, which looked like a shark's. Rows of razor-sharp yellow teeth pushing out and over one another dug into the object and tore away. Blood shone in air briefly as I made out the shape in its claws, a human leg. Nervously, I glanced upward from the leg. Its eyes met mine. Adrenaline coursed through my body. I weakly chucked one of the spoilage cans at it, dropped the others, and dashed back into the lab. I heard it behind me moving as swift as shadows. The chlorine gas fumes were already thick in the air as the floor had turned into a caustic mess and spilled out into production. Behind me, the door didn't have a chance to shut again. The beast held it open and stared at me with black pits. My eyes burned from the fumes. My nose was beginning to sting. I screamed with ferocity and kicked one of the empty drums at it with all the energy I had left. It leapt at me with a matching screech, caught the drum in the air, and then crashed into the chemical pool below. The far door shut. I took my chance and quickly left through the door in my back, slamming it shut. My only hope was that the steel doors would hold. My eyes burned uncontrollably. I couldn't breathe from the combination of fumes and multiple masks. I heard agonizing screams and yelps coming from behind the doors as my head began to spin. I did it. I killed it, then all was black. When I woke, I was in the back of an ambulance. There was a military officer and what I'm assuming was a CDC scientist. They talked quietly amongst themselves for a few minutes until they realized I was conscious. I was hooked up to respirators and ton of other equipment, but I managed to croak out a sentence. What was it? The scientist looked at me with curious eyes. We don't know. We suspect it was something paranormal, but all we know is that it craved human flesh. Well that, and that you killed it. I guess the look I gave them said it all, because the officer gave me a shit-eating grin and said, That's right, son. You killed it. Now get some rest before you play hero. I closed my eyes until I arrived at the hospital. When I woke in my bed, I skipped around the news searching for a report on the carnage, but there was none. I started to reflect on all the events that had occurred in the past two days. Frank and poor David. I wonder how many others had been killed. I wonder if Carlos. Then I remembered what the scientist had said in the ambulance. The beast had a craving for human flesh. I bolted up in my bed. Why did it go for the sloppy Joe cans first? Years had passed, and my memory of each passing second never faltered. Her name was Kate, and she was the one. I was the one to first tell her that I loved her, with tears in her eyes she replied, and I you. It didn't take very long for us to be inseparable, move into our own flat together, marry, and talk of the future. She was my best friend, everything I'd ever wanted in a partner. We could talk to each other for days and be able to carry on with whatever we were discussing. We often talk about the afterlife and what either of us would do in the event of a tragedy. I would always laugh and tell her that I'd haunt her. She, on the other hand, would always say that she would find a way to tell me that she loved me. It was always comforting to hear. After eight years, it happened. A power line had fallen during a storm and her being extremely adventurous decided to park and see what she could do. There was no way of knowing that a live power line was in the puddle that she had stepped in. 
I was told that she died painlessly. I looked up similar experiences while I was able to go a minute without crying. It wasn't painless, it was horrible and the wrong fucking way for her to go. There were no more stars in the sky. It took months for me to be able to act normal, I even worried that I would never be the same. I started reading every book on death that I could find. Nothing could comfort me. I was alone. Reading and reading and reading, and nothing, I never found hope. Crying at night before going to sleep as the new norm, I felt her presence. I knew that I was asleep, but the instant hope that I had been given was enough to fuel Superman for decades. In my dream, I was in a forest, a beautiful forest, and everywhere I looked there was life. That feeling though, my beautiful Kate was here, and I needed to find her. I ran to where my gut had told me to go. And there she was, standing in sunlight, her perfect smile beaming me towards her, beckoning for me to come closer. I did, not with grace though, I tripped over my own feet and crawled to her, barely able to see with all the tears in my eyes. At this point in the dream I'm bawling at her feet before she says my name. Every ounce of sadness, depression, hopelessness, all faded. I couldn't let her see me like this. So I said the only thing that I could think of the only thing that I knew to be true. I'll be here for you soon, okay sweet one? I love you. As if telling the love of my life who had passed on that I loved her wasn't the hardest thing I ever had to do, the dream that housed this perfect resting place for my love had started to wither and fade. I tried to grab her, to take her with me, but her, like the world, turned black and faded. There was nothing but the fucking light coming from the clock on my bedside table. I was enraged, I was hurt, I was alone. Why do I have to live without her? Why couldn't I trade her places? As I screamed in my bed wanting everything to be over with, I heard it, plain as day, and I you. The complete essence of my soul was calm. I could see the stars as they reappeared in the sky. I could see the forest with all of the birds, rabbits, and deer. I could see her smiling, telling me to enjoy this life and when it was over, to come back to her. Her name is Kate, and she is the love of my life. My boyfriend was the one who suggested that I post this story on here because I have been having night terrors a lot recently related to the event which I will tell you shortly. He thinks that if I get it out in the open then maybe I will feel better about all of it. I haven't told my psychiatrist anything, I see him because I suffer from depression and anxiety even before the incident because I didn't want him to think I was crazy. I guess I should go ahead and explain the events that took place. This all happened September of last year over a period of about two months. It all started when I went jogging. Jogging was a semi-new thing for me to start doing. I mean, I've always been athletic and exercised a lot, but I hated jogging running because I always felt awkward running. I think my hips may be out of place so when I run it's like my left foot slams down harder than my right, so I end up with knee pain. Anyways. I had just started nursing school and with that and work I just did not have time to go to the gym so running kinda became my new thing. I had been running about 3-4 to four days a week by September. Still having kind of a tough time but my knees seemed to be adjusting and I wasn't getting winded as easily, running is tough. The town that I live in has a water runoff system, I think that's what it's called, so it's like a man-made creek that encircles the entire city and gets dumped somewhere, I'm not sure. I'm sure there is a name for this system, but I can't think of it right now. Anyways, it runs through a neighborhood next to mine and there is a jogging path that runs along it. That was where I would go run since I liked seeing and listening to the water. It made it like I was kind of escaping the suburbs, even though it was a man-made creek. I dunno, kind of felt more nature why. I'm getting off topic, sorry. So I used to go jogging there. Used to. One day I went jogging on a particularly hot day. 
I live in Texas, and for those of you who don't know, our summers are very, very hot and extend to almost November. On that day, it had to be at least 93 degrees outside. I was running on the path next to the creek, and I remember it stunk so bad. Absolutely reeked. When we have a drought, the creek will dry up so the shallow, stagnant water grows putrid baking in the sun. At least that is what I told myself. The truth was that the creek smelled like something else. It reminded me of this one time when I worked as an aide in a nursing home and I was caring for a client who had a bed sore that had become necrotic and infected. A hot, purulent stench. That is what the creek smelled like that day. I was trying to jog faster as I couldn't take the smell. I was covering my nose, not even caring if the other people jogging along the path saw me. It was all over me. In my nose, in my hair, in my mouth. Almost like I was swimming through it. I couldn't believe the other people running on the path weren't as affected as I was. I thought maybe I was just more sensitive having worked in the medical field. Finally, I reached the point where the path turns away from the creek and runs along behind the houses of my neighborhood. I was relieved to be away from the creek and continued my jog deducing the stench to the possibility of an armadillo, skunk, or coyote that died and rotted in there. I hadn't been running long before something else caught my attention. I was listening to music on my phone, and in between lapses where the music grew loud and then quiet, I heard a strange noise coming from behind me. I instantly knew the sound was breathing. Labored breathing. Not the fat man trying to run labored breathing but physical trauma type of labored breathing. Like sucking in air mixed with cracks and gurgles, regurgitations. I instantly ripped my earbuds out of my ear and snapped my head behind me to see what it was. I'm going to ask for your patience as I continue writing. I feel physically ill typing this. I almost just want to delete this entire post. I know that I need to share this and get this out there because I'm sure someone here has had something similar happen. I just don't want to do this. I turned around and I saw where the breathing was coming from. The crackling, wet, rattled breathing. It was coming from a man jogging behind me. Except he wasn't jogging. He was running backwards. It was almost mechanical looking. His arms at 90 degrees fiercely swishing up and down, propelling himself backwards. I'm sure you have seen people run kind of like this, to work their calf muscles and ease shin splints, I guess that's what it's supposed to do. But he wasn't jogging like that, he was running backwards. All I could see was the back of his head. He had brown, unkempt hair, a purple baseball cap and a black windbreaker suit on. Actually, my first thought wasn't what the hell is going on, but why on earth would you wear a black windbreaker suit in this heat? My thoughts were interrupted by the repetitive shrill of nylon rubbing against nylon. He was running faster. I didn't have a lot of time to think except that I knew I wanted to get away from this man. I knew I could run up the path, across a grassy area to the alley behind my house. I started sprinting now. I had forgotten about my earbuds at this point and could feel the sting of their insulated wires slapping against my thighs. I fled across the large grassy area to the alleyway. My chest was growing hot and tight and my legs were on fire. I was so close to home. Swish swish. I could hear him behind me gaining speed. I started to cry as I continued to exhaustively sprint the stretch of alleyway that lead to the back of my house. I could see the top of it, I started to have hope that I would make it there and this nightmare would be over. I could still hear the guttural sounds erupting from behind me, the hacking of phlegm and sharp inspirations. I made it to the back gate and lunged for the latch. It was simple to unlock, you just have to lift the latch, but my hands were shaking so bad that I was having a hard time gripping and lifting it. My heart pounded in my chest and I knew any second that thing would appear around the fence and come for me. But it didn't. He kept running down the alley. Still trembling and scared, but slightly relieved, 
I craned my neck to give a look at his face. What I saw next almost brought me to my knees. I could feel my face grow hot and saliva fill my mouth. I thought I was going to be sick. He didn't have a face. Not like there was just skin, but no eyes, nose, or mouth. It was almost like a mirror of the back of his head again. Brown hair, purple baseball cap. At this point, I was finally able to pry open the gate and run inside. I could hear my dad in the kitchen, how was your run, sweetheart? But I just ran to him and buried my face in his chest and sobbed and sobbed. I cried there a good couple of minutes before I pulled away from him and he asked me what was wrong and if I was okay. I told him I needed to go to the bathroom first. I went to the bathroom and rain cold water over my face. I was almost convulsing I was shaking so hard. I took several deep breaths and tried to calm myself down, but then I felt it rising up in my throat. I had to vomit. I hurriedly lifted the lid to the toilet and braced myself over the side. I lurched and heaved into the water. I always close my eyes while I vomit because just looking at it makes me want to keep throwing up. I could feel the vomitus burn my nose and throat as it was propelled into the toilet. I couldn't stop. There was so much. Finally, after what had to be at least eight productive heaves into the toilet, I caught my breath, wiped my mouth, and opened my eyes. There, in the bowl of the toilet, was a nebulous mixture of mud and moss, and it smelled like necrotic flesh. I can't write anymore right now. I almost feel like if I keep writing I might somehow will this back into existence. I'm not sure if I even feel better after typing that. But it's time for me to go to sleep anyways. I don't sleep at my house anymore, I sleep with my boyfriend at his house. I sleep there every night. Especially since I started hearing the breathing again. So I can't sleep and I thought I may as well share the day's events with you guys, as I'm currently struggling to make sense of it all. I suppose I'd better start by laying down the basic facts. I'm an 18-year-old male, living in a small, remote English village in the heart of North Yorkshire. The fact that it is situated within the moors means it's a good hour or so away from any real slice of civilization, and consequently, the 300 or so villagers are pretty much the only people I come into contact with for the majority of the year. The village itself is basically just a smattering of houses, with a post office, a couple of shops, a small churchyard, and a pub all dotted around what is effectively the center. The only reason I have access to the internet is through a rather costly satellite connection. But anyway, back to today. It started as any usual Saturday starts, waking up at 9 a.m., working on the farm for a couple of hours, and then relaxing with a handful of other people in the village my age for lunch. There were five of us all together, laying on a patch of field by the outskirts of the center. This was usual. We brought sandwiches and flasks of tea and coffee, as well as some cans of beer we were careful to keep concealed in the basket until right at the last second. After we finished our sandwiches, I hastily passed a can to the others in turn. Then it struck me that someone was missing. Dale wasn't here with us. At 15, he was the youngest of the group, and he was usually the most eager when it came to drinking, likely because he was attempting to prove himself to us. Where's Dale? At this point, it wasn't remotely sinister, I just assumed he was busy and that the others were aware of this. Good point, not sure, didn't see him this morning. This was Susie, an attractive 17-year-old brunette with big brown eyes, which seemed to glisten in the light. I'll admit that I have something of a crush on her. She was Dale's sister, so her rather vague answer puzzled me. You mean he wasn't there when you got up? I asked, intrigued. Well, he's usually up and out of the house before me so that's not unusual or anything. He might have had to finish some farm work off. Yeah, that's probably it I agreed, and thought no more of it for the time being. 
Susie and Dale's father had died a few years previously, and that left Dale having to mature rather quickly, generally doing a large share of the work around the farm. At about 1 p.m. we packed up the stuff, discarding the cans in the usual area behind some bushes. Then we all headed back home. I asked Susie if I could see if Dale was in, as I felt like I should give him his beer, and she let me into the house. Julie, the mum, was sitting at the kitchen table with an old man who had his back to us. She too shared her daughter's attractive features and her piercing eyes looked rather solemn today. Hi Mrs. Harrison, is Dale around? As I said this, a look of pain seemed to resonate throughout her face. The old man scooted around on his stool towards me. I could see now that it was Mr. Heim. Ari Bertheim is the oldest man I have ever met. He must be well into his 90s, but he still retains a youthfulness and vigor in his eccentric and animated character. Allegedly, he fled from Germany during the onset of the Second World War as his political views opposed those of the Nazi party. From there, he took residence up in several countries before settling in the village some 15 years ago. A respected member of the community, he also runs the neighborhood watch, along with his son, Michael. His presence here seemed odd, and I could see through the dark, whether folds of his face that something was up. Paul, it's good to see you. Take a seat. He said, with that strange accent that balanced uneasily between German and Yorkshire. What's going on? Susie asked. Sit down, the both of you. We did as he said, looking at each other with uncertainty. Dale has gone missing. Your mother and I have talked this through, Susie, and we believe he may have run off. He said, bluntly. Susie looked at her mother, who herself was battling to hold back the tears. Why would he run off? Why on earth would he? Susie was evidently dumbfounded by this, as was I. People do sometimes leave the village without warning, especially the younger villagers who grow tired of the lifestyle available to them. But this was still totally unexpected. Didn't he even leave a note or something? I asked, unable to grasp what was going on. No, nothing. However, his clothes are gone, as well as some food, money, and other supplies, so there is no reason to suspect that he is in danger. I know this is a shock to you all, but you have to remain calm. I will do my best to get in contact with him. We should call the police. Susie spurted after a moment. There is very little they could do Susie. He could be anywhere, and there is no point sending them up here to the moors. I fear it would be fruitless. Mr. Heim said. He's right, Susie. Your brother has made his decision to leave. We have to respect it. The best we can hope for is a phone call or a letter. He might return soon enough. Julie added, evidently pained by this. Mr. Heim then got up slowly and steadily from the stool, bowing his bald head to each of us in turn before making his way out. As he was about to leave, I caught him looking back through the door at the mother as she began to sob and smiling in a way that was pretty chilling. I stayed for a few minutes after and then returned home to explain the situation to my parents. Now I'm here, in bed, writing this up. I think there's more to this than there seems on the surface. It was that sly smirk that Mr. Heim flashed before he left. Something is wrong with the whole situation. I'm going to use this as a sort of diary. I'll keep you updated. D2. I had a dream last night that someone was throwing rocks at my bedroom window. I got up to open it, and I saw Dale standing there, naked, with stitches and scars covering his entire body. I shouted out to him, and he just smiled, the same fucking smile that Mr. Heim flashed at Julie. Then I woke up. It's really freaked me out. I've just got this overwhelming sense that Mr. Heim knows more than he's letting on. I plan to investigate. I went over to Dale's house again 
and talk to Susie. She's not coping particularly well, it seems. She can't understand why this has happened out of the blue. I've convinced her to do a little snooping around with me. Seems like I'm not the only who felt uneasy about Haim. Susie said that her mom heard something outside the night before Dale went missing and swears that she saw Mr. Haim walking around the house when she looked. I'm not sure whether to tell Susie about my dream. I think it would probably be a bit too insensitive at this stage. We decided to take a look around his house. We knew that he and his son were usually out in the afternoon as it seems Mr. Haim is the most active 90-year-old ever to have lived. They tend to take long walks around the moors, so we thought we'd search for some clues about Dale. The house is one of the largest in the village, situated opposite the church. Its grounds are largely overgrown, with ruptured vines of ivy hanging over the old brickwork like torn flags representing some old, forgotten nation. We located an open window around the back and climbed through. I'd been in this house a few times over the years, as Mr. Heim often held social events here, usually after a wedding or funeral. We were in a small but rather grand-looking dining area, dusty but cozy. A large mahogany table was situated in the center. Around the room were various bookshelves. I studied them briefly, the books were then largely related to medical practices, and I remembered that my mother had said he trained as a surgeon. There were also a few books on the Second World War, which seemed fairly expected. We decided to sweep through the floor separately, but after a good ten minutes of searching, neither of us found anything of significance. The only unnerving item I found was a small bookmark with a red swastika in its center. On it were the words Zuto Arst. I had no idea what it meant, and neither did Susie, so we left it at that. Why someone who fled the Nazi regime would have a swastika bookmark is beyond me. Susie also noted a machete hanging in his bedroom, which too was engraved with German words, Schlachter von Mauthausen. Again, I don't know what that means, but a framed machete is still a scary prospect. I couldn't help but think of the dream with Dale when I saw it, all those scars on his body. We soon left the house, and we're both at a loose end here, sitting in Dale's room with no information or clues. I never thought I would regret it. It was stupid, really. I was standing in the line to buy a lunch ticket and my friend Jason comes over and says in a Darth Vader voice, I will trade you a lunch ticket for your immortal soul. I told him to shut up. So he said it again, this time only immortal soul he tried to make sound scary, seriously. You're immortal soul and you don't have to wait in this line. I said fine, grabbed the ticket out of his hand, and walked over to the lunch trays. He followed me. Hey, I have another one. Do you think Emma might give me her immortal soul? I didn't think she would. Emma would just crinkle up her nose and ignore him. Nah. Try Jenny. I bet you could at least get her to kiss you for it if you're lucky. I watched him head over to Jenny, and after Jenny shyly kissed his cheek, she followed him to the lunch trays, ticket in hand behind his thumbs up. Jason moved away not too long after, and who really keeps track of friends from fifth grade? No one. I grew up, got married, had a kid, and never thought about the time I said I would trade my immortal soul again. Then one day I was driving my family on a freeway and fell asleep. Just for a second, but in that second we ran into some traffic, and I was behind a semi. The last thing I remember is my wife screaming my name. I swerved, but not soon enough. My car hit the back of the semi on the passenger's side. My wife and my daughter, who was sitting behind my wife on the passenger's side, were dead on impact. The next thing I remember is laying on the asphalt, paramedics around me trying to revive me. It was hot, I was thirsty, and it was bright. The light hurt my eyes. I remember someone putting a plastic cup over my nose and everything going dark as I passed out. 
And then I remember waking up here. I wasn't in a hospital, but I was hovering in and out of consciousness. It felt like a flickering. Things I remember from the period I would remember in flickers, almost like an old silent movie, but less coherent. Every so often someone would stand over me, but they were a blur and a flicker. And then, as I recovered and became more stable, no one came at all. I don't know how long it was from when I arrived to when my eyes were able to focus when I woke up, but the first thing I was really conscious of was the sound of running water and the metal clanging of what I would soon realize were operating utensils being cleaned and sanitized. Things are going well, Brian, said a calm voice I didn't recognize. I'm sorry about your wife and daughter. There was nothing I could do for them. They were dead for too long before they were brought to me. He walked over. And because it was difficult to hold my head, the first thing I remember about him were his hands. It was the only detail I could see then. He was drying them on a white disposable towel. They were large, with flat fingers, and coarse blonde hair covered the back of them and his forearms thickly, but you... You were different. After all, you sold me your soul. I like to think that possibly because of that day my will for you to live overrode your desire to die with your family. Jason? I heard him chuckle lowly and felt that he was pleased I remembered him. You're a lucky guy to have befriended such a brilliant doctor so early in life. It was comforting to have him there and while he would leave during the day, at night he would come back, look after me, and keep me company. It turns out I was in his basement which he had roughly modified for my care. He brought down his favorite armchair and a TV, and in the evenings we would watch TV where he would read to me from his armchair as I recovered and slowly grew stronger. One night while he was reading, he stopped pretty abruptly and became thoughtful. Instead of asking him what he was thinking about, which was my first question, I asked how he had come to know about my accident, how long he had been back in the area, and why he hadn't looked me up sooner. He seemed very pleased with my questions. I actually have a confession to make, Brian, he told me ever since the day back in the fifth grade when you sold me your soul, I felt responsible for you. You and Jenny. I've followed you both loosely, I felt tied to you. But you never contacted me? He sighed. I never had time for social calls. I've always had bigger plans, and then he read until I fell asleep. A few nights later, I was well enough to sit up. He asked if I'd like some tea. Sitting up and drinking tea sounded like a miracle to me. When I asked for peppermint, he smiled, added a bag of tea to a mug, handed it to me, and sat in his chair. How long has peppermint tea been your favorite? he asked. I thought about it then frowned. Actually, I've never really liked tea before, I admitted. So, since now, we both found that funny, and laughed, the first time I've laughed in weeks. Peppermint tea has been my favorite since my junior year of undergrad, he said. He was silent for a minute and I knew he was thinking about wording whatever he was going to say next very carefully, but I was getting sleepy. The tea was so relaxing. I could see why people liked it. Brian, he said, I save lives every day. I save good people. People like you. If I could have, I would have saved your wife and daughter if it would have been in my power. Despair, pain, and guilt flooded over me. I'd been so content with Jason, I hadn't thought about them in weeks. But I was getting sleepier too, so it dulled quickly. Brian, you do understand I could have saved them if I had been more powerful, don't you? I knew it. Brian, he said, you are dying. Years ago I asked you for something, but since you didn't really believe I wanted it, I didn't get what I wanted. Not completely. I'm going to ask you for it again. I'm sure I don't need to explain our connection now that my thoughts are your thoughts, my tastes are your tastes, and Milo can be imposed on you. Now that you really see what I can do, now that you know how important I can be to people, can you deny me the power to save more people, to 
to use a greater force to impose my will to do great things? I was so sleepy. Brian, I can still save you. Will you help me do great things? Can I have your soul? The room was growing black and my eyelids were closing as I consented. Since then I've helped him do the same thing to Jenny and countless others. Every time I watch the process, then the ritual, I see less and less resistance as he grows stronger. Everything he does is great, he's a brilliant man, but not everything is good. Some people die. My only comfort is that someday he will die, and someone will collect his soul. But that thought grows weaker with every addition he makes. This happened a few years ago when I was in college. Our school wasn't big or well known. It had two branches. The main one, where they taught kids from nursery to grade 6, was located beside the road and the other, we called it Annex, was located two blocks from it. The Annex was where I studied. It had two buildings, one for high school and one for college. The high school department was packed with students. It was almost always noisy. Our building, on the other hand, was gloomy, and there were very few students. Like, only five to ten people in a class. If we were lucky, there were twenty. Our hallways were quiet. There were rooms that were never occupied. Since no one was using those rooms, the lights were off and at night I found that really disturbing because I walked through dimly lit corridors while my footsteps echoed. I know, our school didn't seem like what a school should be, but hey, my tuition was free, I was a scholar and only needed to maintain good grades, and the place was just ten minutes from home. I had no reason to complain. Anyway, while I was waiting for my next class, I got bored of whatever I was doing and decided to go to the fourth floor. As I was walking up the stairs, I saw my English teacher wearing an orange outfit. I stopped and smiled at her. Good afternoon, ma'am. I expected her to reply, but she didn't. She didn't even smile or acknowledge me. She just continued walking. Down the stairs. She passed by me without sparing me a glance. I became worried. Maybe she was angry at me. But what for? I hadn't done anything bad to her. I decided to try and catch her attention again. Ma'am, are you okay? No response. It was like she didn't hear me. I frowned. She didn't seem like herself. Weird. But that wasn't weird enough to keep me thinking so I just shrugged it off and thought other stuff. When I passed by the faculty room, I heard a familiar voice. It was so loud and clear, there was no way I could have mistaken it. It was the voice of my English teacher. So I went into the faculty room and found my English teacher behind a desk, telling some random story to my classmate who sat directly in front of her. When she saw me, she smiled and greeted me. You could imagine my confusion at this point. I just saw her a few minutes ago. She went down. How come she was here? Ma'am, did you go downstairs a while ago? She seemed surprised with the question but answered anyway. No, why did you ask? My mind was thinking for a logical explanation but couldn't find any. Um, I just saw you a few minutes ago. You were taking the stairs. I greeted you but you ignored me. She frowned. I've been here the whole time. Oh, okay, that's weird. I swear I saw you. This time, my classmate spoke up. We've been here for half an hour, at least. Nobody left this room. That was when I noticed her clothes. The one I saw at the stairs was wearing an orange outfit. The one in front of me was wearing brown. A sense of dread surged through me. I asked the most obvious question. Then who was the woman I saw? But then I knew the answer to that myself. 
I had heard stories about these creatures. I just never thought I'd encounter one. And in broad daylight. Doppelganger. This creature copies a person's appearance and it's said that once you see your doppelganger, you'll die. I don't know if it's true. I don't ever want to find out. My teacher freaked out and we spent the afternoon waiting for the fake English teacher to show up, but it never did. Pretty soon, this little incident was forgotten, and I thought that was the last time I encountered something like that. Well, I was wrong. The next incident happened a few months after the first. Again, I saw a nursery teacher I was rather fond of standing at the guardhouse. Let's call her Teacher Marie. It was pretty late already, so I was wondering why she was still at school, so I called her. She didn't respond. She didn't even seem to hear me. I called again. Nope, I was invisible. I figured she was just tired and wasn't in the mood to have a chat. I went inside the library and saw Hannah. She was an assistant teacher who used to be a college acquaintance and was close friends with teacher Marie. I casually approached her and asked, Hey, I saw Teacher Marie at the guardhouse. Is she waiting for you so that you two can go home together? She seems tired and I think she'll appreciate it if you hurry. She raised an eyebrow. Really? I thought she went home already. Then she gathered her things and exited the library. A few minutes later, she returned. She's not there. She said. Oh, maybe she got tired of waiting and left. No, Kath, she was never there. I frowned and closed the book I was planning to read. What do you mean she was never there? I saw her. Ask the guard. I already did. He didn't see Teacher Marie. Are you sure it was her? Her face was dead serious. I'm sure, I said. It was definitely her. I called her, but she never looked back. Shit, she cursed. You're scaring me. She picked up her phone, dialed Teacher Marie's number, and told her what I saw. It was a brief conversation that ended with be careful. Days went by. I hadn't seen a doppelganger again, and I assumed that was the end of it. I wasn't really that scared, but it didn't mean I was eager to repeat the experience. One afternoon, as I was chilling out, a classmate of mine approached me and said, Whoa, how did you get here so fast? Naturally, I was confused. What do you mean? I asked. Well, I saw you at the other end of the building a few minutes ago. Come to think of it, you seemed a little off. I called you several times, but you just ignored me. Is there anything wrong? I froze. I felt my heartbeat accelerate. Tina, I said slowly. I've been here since lunchtime. The person you saw isn't me. She shook her head. No, it's definitely you. You got the same hair and everything. My blood ran cold. I swear it isn't me. Her mouth hung open. Then who? She stopped right there. She didn't need to ask. She knew the answer already. She heard stories about the creature that went around copying people's faces and the horror that would befall on the ones who unfortunately laid eyes on it. My English teacher didn't see it. Teacher Marie didn't either. Now it was my turn. And I wished I wouldn't too. My story begins several years ago. I'm only posting this now because up until this point, I was able to convince myself that it was just my imagination. But hopefully you guys will be able to tell me what this was. I'm 14 years old. It's a Saturday. My dad is on a bike ride and my mom is having lunch with a friend, so I'm home alone. But it's in the daytime, so I don't really have a problem with it. 
I'm just sitting in the kitchen, on Facebook and YouTube, you know, just the usual teenager wife things. But then I hear a noise. It's not like a scary, paranormal scream or anything. It just sounds like the printer running. Which is weird, because we usually keep our printer turned off unless we need to use it. I couldn't remember my mom or dad turning on the printer that day, and I definitely hadn't done it. I kind of sat there, frozen, just listening intently to that sound. I can't even describe what sound a printer makes. It's sort of like a weird chugging. I just waited for it to stop. I waited a minute. Two minutes. Three minutes. Even though I couldn't think for the life of me why something would be printing anyway, I figured that whatever it was printing, it would stop eventually, it didn't. The noise kept going. To give some context to the proximity between me and the printer, my house is a one-story rambler. The kitchen slash living room is to the left of the foyer, and the bedroom slash study, where the printer was, is to the right. Even though the printer was basically on the other side of the house, I could hear it ridiculously clearly. It just kept chugging and chugging. At this point, I was ridiculously terrified. I couldn't even run back to my room, because that would require running past the study where the printer is. I didn't dare go back and investigate what was making that noise. But I eventually figured, after another few minutes of painful anxiety, what choice did I have? It's just a printer. I told myself as I slowly rose from my seat with the intention of going to the study. Nevertheless, I armed myself with the biggest kitchen knife I could find, looking back, what good was this going to do against a printer? I edged down the hallway towards the study. But when I reached the foyer, the noise suddenly stopped. I think the sudden halt of the chugging startled me more than the noise originally had. I straightened up. I had been crouching like an idiot and started walking normally towards the study. But the absence of that noise had given me a false sense of security. I had almost reached the door of the study when I felt something so indescribably horrible. It wasn't a chill, it wasn't goosebumps. It was this terrible hotness throughout my entire body. My ears burned, my stomach felt like it dropped right out of me, and my vision blurred for a second. I ran like hell down the hallway and frantically dialed my mother, why I didn't call 911, I don't know. I guess I just wanted to hear a familiar voice. But when she picked up the phone, I didn't even know what to say. What could I say that didn't sound ridiculous? Mom, I'm scared because I think the printer turned on. No. So, instead, I hysterically told her that I thought someone was burglarizing the house. My mom's friend ended up calling 911 while I was still on the phone with my mom. She told me to get out of the house as fast as possible and stay on the line with her. I obliged and ran outside, still clutching the kitchen knife. That terrible fire that I'd felt had subsided, but I was still really shaky. Neighbors started to gather outside as the police pulled up. I'm sure I looked insane death gripping a kitchen knife and tears streaming down my face. The two police went into my house and came out less than five minutes later. They said that everything was clear and there was no sign of a break-in. They asked me a few questions, none of which I could properly answer because I was still so shaken up. One of them waited with me until my mom came home, I refused to go back into the house alone, and the two of us went back into the house together. With my mom at home, I had the courage to venture into the study and see if it was really the printer that had been making the noises it must have been because the police said there were no signs of a break-in. With bated breath, I peeked in and stared intently at the printer. The power button was unlit, it wasn't on. I wasn't sure if this scared me more if I had found the printer on. If it was on, then who had turned it on? But since it was off, what was making those noises? I kept myself busy for the rest of the evening, trying to push it out of my mind. I'd pretty much succeeded, and when I went to my bedroom to finally get some sleep, I was feeling normal again. 
I went into my room and turned on the light, when I saw the most terrifying thing I think I've ever seen in my life. On my bed sat a single piece of white printer paper. It wasn't folded, it didn't have anything on it. It was just a piece of harmless paper. The thing is, I hadn't been in my room all day and I would definitely have remembered if I'd put a blank piece of paper on my bed. My parents don't go in my room, so I know it wasn't them. I don't care what the police said. Now I knew that someone, or something, had been in my house. But what the scariest part is, I think, is that it, whatever it is, didn't leave a message. Why would a ghost turn on a printer, and then leave a blank piece of paper? What does that even mean? I threw away the piece of paper, obviously, but that didn't stop me from being terrified. But nothing like this has happened to me since that day. And so, for the past five years, I've tried to pretend that it was just the printer. Have you ever felt like someone was watching you? Maybe you turn around quickly, searching the room for a threat which you cannot find. Or maybe you're in the shower and close your eyes, letting the water run over your face to wash off the soap. You open them quickly, don't you? Expecting something to be there. Then you feel silly, right? When you realize that nobody's watching you? I'm here to tell you that you are not silly. Your fear is not wrong. There is someone watching you, always. They're called the Dark Ones. Your Dark One is a force of your own creation. We all have one. It is a ball of negative energy which grows stronger over time. When you were one and hit your mother for the first time, your Dark One grew stronger. When you were five and refused to share a toy in preschool, your Dark One grew stronger. At ten when you refused to clean your room, your Dark One grew stronger. You have created your own worst nightmare. In our universe, everything must have a balance. It is a basic law of life, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. That is where the Light Ones come in. Your Light One is a force of your own creation. We all have one. It is a ball of positive energy which grows stronger over time. When you were one and hugged your mother, your light one grew stronger. When you were five and gave someone a painting you had made in preschool, your light one grew stronger. When you were ten and put away the dishes, your light one grew stronger. You have created your own protector. For most of us, our dark one and light one are of equal strength. That is why you feel your dark one sometimes, watching and waiting for a chance to strike but it never comes because your light one is there protecting you. Many of us can live full and happy lives without any knowledge that our dark one is there because of our light one. Of course, some have figured out that these forces exist. Ever heard of your guardian angel from Christian mythology? Sound familiar? But this is so, so rare. But there are the unlucky ones. When I was six years old, my father accidentally wrecked our car while driving home from my grandma's house during a thunderstorm. Both of my parents were crushed in the front seat. I was the only survivor. That is when it began. You see, my light one used up too much energy protecting me during that crash. It threw off the balance so that my dark one was stronger. However, for some of us unlucky ones, the cause of the unbalance is never really known. Maybe they were sick on a day when their car would have crashed, or they drove by a restaurant where they would have gotten food poisoning instead of walking right in. But, in the end, whether the cause is known or not known, the result is the same. It began when I was six. Because I was so young, my dark one was still rather weak, so it manifested itself in only little ways. From time to time, a stuffed animal would be found in the oven while I'd left it on my bed. Plates would break inexplicably. Things like that. As I grew older, she grew stronger. Sometimes, 
I'd catch a glimpse of my dark one in the form of a pale woman in a black cloak from the corner of my eye. Other times, our heavy mahogany table would be found flipped completely upside down. As I grew older, she grew stronger. I would wake up to deep scratches across my legs. My stuffed animals would be ripped apart at the seams, their stuffing covering my floor. As I grew older, she grew stronger. When I was eight years old, my beloved grandmother grew sick and died. She had been my guardian, mother, and friend. I was devastated. From there, I was transferred from foster home to foster home. In each case, something would go horribly wrong. My first foster parents, devout Christians, declared that I was cursed after plates began flying off shelves and pets began to die. In my second foster home, my foster parents became convinced that I was a demon in disguise after chairs began throwing themselves against the walls. In my third foster home, I was declared a violent delinquent after my foster mother awoke to deep gashes on her back. In my fifth foster home, a therapeutic foster home for troubled children, my foster father, a healthy 46-year-old, died of a major heart attack. I was finally placed in a correctional facility and things died down for a while. Two weeks ago, I was released into a halfway program. I was given my own apartment in their special facility. Again, things started small. I would come home to find objects moved around. My pillows, which had been lying on the bed, now lay on my kitchen floor. And then it escalated. Plates would randomly fall out of the shelves and break. A dark form would appear in my peripheral vision, then disappear. Something was constantly watching me. And then it escalated. Entire chairs would throw themselves across the room. Neighbors complained about the noise, and the healthy cat who lived in the apartment across from mine died without a cause. And then it escalated. I awoke this morning to deep scratches across my chest. I know what is coming now. I know what the next step is, and I have accepted it in a few days' time, it will escalate again and I, a healthy 19-year-old, will be found dead. I have come to this site because everything here must be taken as if it is true and I'm begging that you take my story as truth as well. Not just because you have to, but because it is. Learn from my story. Look both ways before you cross the street. Don't do drugs. Cherish the ones you love. Live life carefully. But most of all, hope and pray that your energy stays balanced. Hope and pray that you don't end up like me.